Good morning. The first item of business today is general questions, and we start with question number one from Kate Forbes. To ask the Scottish Government how many affordable homes will have been built between 2007 and 2021. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Between April 2007 and December 2017, uh, there has been a total of 72,462 affordable homes delivered. From this, 53,465 uh, are newly built. The next quarterly update showing affordable housing completions for the whole of 2017-18 will be published on the 12th of June. Uh, over the course of this Parliament, uh, we will fully expect to deliver our ambitious target of delivering over 50,000 affordable homes, 35,000 of which will be for social rent. Kate Forbes. I wholeheartedly welcome that commitment because the Minister will know how important affordable housing is in my constituency to everything else, jobs, education and even healthcare. And those figures are very impressive. Would the Minister accept an invitation to my constituency to meet with key stakeholders to discuss how the government's target and how their previous successful building has enabled rural areas to grow? Minister. Um, Thank you, President Officer. Um, local authority, of course, have the statutory requirement to produce a, a local housing strategy, which I know that uh, Ms Forbes will be aware of, and they need to set out their priorities in that. Uh, over the course of uh, uh, the next few years, Highland Council will have been allocated over £184 million uh, to for affordable homes. Um, I would be absolutely delighted to accept uh, Ms Forbes' uh, invitation to visit our constituency. Uh, I made a promise to visit Tilaki MacDonald of Sky and Loch Alsh Housing Association uh, when I met him recently in Concarden and Fife. Uh, so we will arrange that and I'll be very pleased to visit uh, Ms Forbes' beautiful constituency. Graham Simpson. Um, well, in that spirit, I wonder if the uh, minister would like to visit uh, my region uh, with me um, and meet some of the stakeholders there. Um, could uh, the, the actual question is, and you can answer that, um, can I ask what analysis the government has done on whether uh, the money for affordable homes uh, is being spent uh, in areas of Scotland most in need of affordable homes uh, and uh, what analysis has been done on the type of homes being built? Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I'm more than happy to visit any part of Scotland to see um, our affordable uh, homes programme uh, delivering for uh, every part of Scotland. Um, Mr Simpson has asked a pretty comprehensive question there uh, around about analysis. As he very well uh, knows, I keep a, a very close eye on what is being delivered um, uh, across uh, the country. If he wants to write to me with more specific questions around about analysis, I'm, I'll happily um, answer uh, his points in that regard. But as I've made uh, very clear, presiding officer, in this chamber on many occasions, I want um, our affordable housing programme to deliver for all of Scotland. Uh, I want local authorities to look at the areas where there are most needs. Um, and to deliver uh, for communities uh, across the board. Elaine Smith. Thank you, presiding officer. In terms of um, people in need of affordable homes, is the minister aware that almost 10,000 disabled people are stuck on the waiting list for suitable affordable housing and with demand set to rise by 80% over the next five years, will the government reconsider setting targets for how many of the 50,000 new affordable homes must be disabled accessible? Um, I thank Ms Smith for uh, the question. It gives me the opportunity, as I did last week, uh, to reiterate um, the fact that the government has stated that in terms of subsidy for wheelchair accessible and specialist housing, we will be flexible um, so that local authorities, housing associations uh, can build to meet the needs of people in their area. I don't want to set an arbitrary target. Um, it is up to local authorities to look um, at the needs and demands in their area. Um, some local authorities, um, like Angus, if I remember rightly, have set a target of 16% um, of uh, the housing that they're del delivering, being wheelchair um, accessible or specialist homes. I want all local authorities not only to look at their housing needs and demands assessment, but also to interrogate their waiting lists to see uh, who is waiting uh, for these kind of homes and to get on with the job uh, of delivering the, those homes in their areas. Now is the time to 
do that. The, the subsidy is there, the flexibility is there, uh, and they must go and work and meet the needs of people right across the country. And Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. In light of the fact that many of the homes in Kate Forbes constituency are, are second and holiday homes, and in light of a report I published yesterday showing 26,000 of these across Scotland, does the Minister agree that second or holiday homes should be subject to planning consent? Minister. I think that uh, we need to look closely um, at some areas where there is a difficulty um, with uh, second homes and holiday homes. But we must remember um, that these holiday homes bring income into areas uh, the likes of Sky and other parts of Scotland. What we need to do is to increase uh, the amount of homes that we are delivering uh, in these places so that people uh, who ch choose to live and work there um, have the right accommodation. Uh, Mr Whiteman will be aware um, that local authorities have flexibilities around council tax um, for holiday homes and second homes and you know I would urge councils uh, to use these powers um, it's their responsibility to do so. Question number two, David Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government when it plans to publish the findings of the 50 miles per hour speed limit pilot for HGVs on the A9. Minister Hamza Yusuf. We, planning, uh, we plan to publish the findings of the A9 HGV pilot uh, later on uh, this summer. The research into the performance of the A9 with a higher HGV limit in place uh, is currently being evaluated and, as I say, will be published uh, in, uh, later uh, in, in the summer. Uh, there is also, of course, as the members probably aware, some data coming from uh, DFT in terms of the, uh, the, 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 the uplift in speed limits in Highways England. We'll be looking forward to receiving that in the coming months also. David Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Does the Minister share my view that the pilot for HGVs on the A9 has been a success? Is this not the time to extend the speed limit for HGVs to 50 for all single carriageways in Scotland, which would be good news for the haulage industry, good news for safety campaigners, and good news for the climate as HGVs at 50 miles per hour are less polluting? Is it, if it's good enough for the A9, why is it not good enough for all of Scotland? Minister. Uh, can I say I'm very sympathetic uh, to the points that David Stewart makes. I would just make a couple of other points just to, to ensure uh, that we are putting this conversation in the context it should be in. And that is that, of course, we know that every safety campaign will tell you any uplift in speed is the biggest contributor to potentially fatal uh, and indeed uh, serious uh, casualties on a trunk road network. So we have to be mindful of that. The A9, of course, the uplift in the speed is also being done in conjunction with the fact we have average speed cameras there as well. So we have to look at other parts of the trunk road network uh, single or dual carriageway that don't have average speed cameras. But I am sympathetic. So we have the data coming from the A9 pilot, which I will publish in, 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 in uh, the coming uh, weeks. We also have the data coming from the Department for Transport, which I think is towards the end of summer, uh, autumn that we're expecting uh, into, into their uplift in speed limit. If, we, if the data shows that we can do this in a way that doesn't compromise uh, uh, safety on our trunk roads and indeed uh, is not counterproductive to our uh, climate agenda, then it is something that I am very sympathetic to and I know David Stewart uh, will appreciate those points and I'll ensure that he's kept up to date on them. Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. I appreciate hearing this response from the Minister but to ask the Scottish Government whether any assessments have been made or consideration given to increasing speed limits for HGVs from 40 to 50 on some parts of the A75. Minister. Well, again, we're looking at the trunk road network as a, as, as a whole, and I think, you know, looking at the A9, we'd have to probably look at other areas that have uh, average speed camera measures on them as well, the A77, perhaps the A90, uh, Dundee to Stonehaven. But if there is a compelling case, and the Department for Transport data will be important in this, if there's a compelling case to do that right across the trunk road network, of course, the A75 would be included in that. Uh, and, and as I say, the research that is coming that we'll be analysing, I'll ensure is also made available to Emma Harper as well. Question number three, Rhoda Grant. To ask the Scottish Government what it's doing to reduce waiting times for children's health services in the Highlands. Cabinet Secretary, Shona Robinson. There are a number of initiatives underway to improve waiting times for children's health services in the Highlands, including improved workforce planning, staff development, caseload management and better use of technology. However, recruitment to some specialties continues to be a challenge. Rhoda Grant. A total of 151 children and young people in Highland are waiting more than 18 weeks for services such as speech th and language therapy, occupational therapy, dietetics, due to staffing difficulties. There's also a shortage of school nurses with more than seven vacancies and in addition, two have retired last month. The risk to health visiting is reported as high and the shortage of 
health visitors means that children are not receiving many of the visits laid down on the health visitors' home visiting pathway. What is the Cabinet Secretary going to do to make sure that those children get the best start in life? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I thank Rhoda Grant for uh, her question? Um, Highland Council uh, have advised that staffing continues to, to be an issue, particularly for speech and language therapy, but they have recruited uh, to a number of occupational therapy posts recently, so they expect waiting times uh, to decrease. Um, the AHP workforce, which Rhoda Grant refers to, uh, are crucial here and are expanding um, and, of course, are providing that really important support to uh, early uh, years. Uh, the Highlands have tried some quite innovative uh, ways of uh, improving services. So, for example, uh, uh, Rhoda Grant may be aware of the telephone consultation and triage that's being developed to give people quicker access to advice and support and building greater universal resources for parents uh, and professionals to support self-management for those children with perhaps lower levels of needs in line with the national model for children's AHP services. And of course, the health visiting services uh, are expanding and we're on track to deliver uh, the uh, additional uh, 500 health visitors that we have committed to. And of course, Highland are getting their share of that. Question number four, Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its role is in maintaining the school estate, and I remind members I'm the PLO to the Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presiding Officer, under the Education 1980 Act, it is the responsibility of all local authorities to maintain the school estate. However, the Scottish Government's £1.8 billion school building programme is helping to replace the schools in the worst condition across Scotland. Jenny Gilruth. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. What the young people of Glenrothes really need in the town's 70th year are school buildings fit for learning. Yet both Glenrothes and Glenwood High School buildings have a poor rating according to the most recent Scottish Government data published in 2016. Will the Scottish Government work with Fife Council to ensure that Glenrothes' schools are prioritised to allow for improvements to be made? Secretary. Uh, so first of all, let me um, record my good wishes to Glenrothes on the 70th anniversary of the uh, establishment of the new town, uh, can I say that uh, Fife Council was awarded significant funding of over £57 million towards the construction of a number of schools, one of which was in Glenrothes, uh, Ochmuti High School, um, which was opened in August 2013 under our Schools for the Future programme. And I have committed to, taking, to announcing further details on the enhancement of the learning estate uh, later on this year and the development work is underway for that. And of course we will discuss this matter with local authorities uh, in due course. Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, can the Cabinet Secretary provide details for the number of schools which uh, have been renovated and have removed asbestos uh, from the building, as well as the number of school buildings that still contain asbestos? Cabinet Secretary. The, the, the Government doesn't hold that information because in my original answer to Jenny Gilruth, I made the point that local authorities are responsible for the maintenance and the management of the school estate. Um, we expect local authorities to handle issues in relation to asbestos, um, uh, to take those issues very seriously, and we expect local authorities to follow the very strict guidelines and recommendations from the Health and Safety Executive in this respect to ensure that they maintain an asbestos register at local authority level and to ensure that all risks that are inherent in the handling of asbestos are fully assessed as part of the management responsibility of local authorities. Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Deputy First Minister knows my personal interest in the school estate in my constituency, where Liberton High School is in desperate need of replacing. For the whole of devolution, the Scottish Government have had a critical play, role to play in financing new schools, and the Government keeps saying that the new scheme is coming. So does the Cabinet Secretary not accept that given the many years it takes to plan, design and build new schools, there's now the Scottish Government who are holding back vital improvements to the school and state, including at Liberton. The rumour up the road is that there will be no Scottish Government money for the way four schools in Edinburgh. Can he confirm or deny that? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I, well, fundamentally, I don't accept the premise of Mr uh, Johnson's question. Um, the Government has fully committed the Schools for the Future programme up until 2021. So that's three years away in terms of long-term planning. And I've said, and I've always said, that the revised programme, the next stage of the programme, will be announced later this year. 
so that will give plenty of planning time to local authorities to adjust their plans. And in terms of the actions of this government, I would remind Mr Johnson that this government inherited, when this government came to office, we inherited a legacy from the Labour Party where uh, 61, only 61% of schools were in a satisfactory condition. That's now 86% under this government, <laughs> under our investment. So Mr Johnson has got no grounds for complaints. Question number five, Bill Bowman. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it will take to reduce the number of people who have never been in, in employment. Minister Jimmy Hepburn. <clears throat> The Scottish Government's employment programme, Fair Start Scotland, launched in April and will support at least 38,000 people over a three-year referral period. This programme is targeted towards those facing barriers to enter employment, including people with disabilities and the long-term unemployed. In March, I announced the publication of No One Left Behind, next steps for the integration alignment of employability support in Scotland. This sets out the next steps the Scottish Government will take to deliver more effective and joined-up employability support across Scotland. It also starts a wider discussion with our partners on how we do that. It contains a range of activity, it will develop and implement collaboratively with our partners with a specific focus on integrating employability provision with health, justice and housing support and serves to help those people who are further from the labour market. Bill Bowman. Thank you for that answer. Of course, there are many reasons why some people cannot work, but that can only partly explain why more than one in ten, that's one in ten, Dundonians have never had a job of any sort. Given this figure has arisen, risen for a decade under both an SNP government and an SNP-run council, can the Minister explain what he will do about this? Minister. What we will be doing is taking forward our Fair Start Scotland programme, which, unlike the UK Government's approach to employability, won't threaten them with sanctions, which, as we know, through the Economic and Social Research Council published last May, the paper they published last May, it shows that it uh, is actually doing little to enhance people's motivation to prepare for, seek or enter paid work and in fact leads to recurrent short-term movements between various insecure jobs interspersed with periods of unemployment described as being routine. So we'll be taking a different approach, supporting people in Dundee and across Scotland into employment. Ivan McKee. Uh, thank you. Does the Minister agree that the Scottish Government's approach to helping those fillers to move from the labour market to return to work is more effective than the actions being taken by the UK Government? Well, yes. indeed I do. I would, uh, I would refer back to the, the point I just made a, a, a moment ago. We see again in that uh, report from the Economic and Social Research uh, Council that uh, they say welfare conditionality within the social security system is largely ineffective in facilitating people's entry into or progression within the paid labour market over time. Not my words, not the Scottish Government words, the words of the Economic and Social Research Council through a study assisted by the University of Glasgow and Harriet Watt University. So, yes, I think it approaches it much better than the UK government. Question number six, Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it can take to prevent further business closures in Stirling City Centre. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Um, the Scottish Government is supporting inclusive economic growth across Scotland, including in Stirling. Just last week, the Cabinet Secretary for Economy, Jobs and Fair Work, Keith Brown, signed heads of terms for the Stirling and Clackmanager City Region deal, committing £45.1 million over 10 years to a range of projects that will benefit Stirling and the entire region. The overall investment package in the City Region is expected to deliver over 5,000 new jobs across the region and leverage additional private sector investment worth over £600 million. This is alongside an additional £5 million for the Kildeen Business Park and infrastructure at Callander, taking this government's funding to £50.1 million. The Scottish Government since 2017 has also supported the successful establishment of Stirling City Centre Business Improvement District. This will run for five years, enabling local businesses to invest through a levy to improve economic opportunities for business, agree and deliver improvements and take charge of regeneration needs of their area. Dean Lockhart. I thank the Minister for that response. Notwithstanding the steps he's outlined, a number of businesses in Stirling have been forced to close in the past year, with five closing in the last two weeks alone. On top of this, there are 1,600 businesses across Stirling which have rate appeals outstanding for more than a year. These businesses employ thousands of people, and for many of them, the decision on the rate appeal will be the difference between staying in the business or being forced to close. What steps will the Minister take? to urgently address this situation and, uh, and obtain clarity for the future of these businesses. Minister. 
Well, I, th I think the member should recognise that um, we are already committing a, a £720 million package of non-domestic rates relief, uh, covering over 100,000 premises across Scotland, including 2,868 in the Stirling uh, constituency area. We know that Federation of Small Business Survey explains the 18.9% of businesses they sampled uh, in receipt of small business bonus might close their business in the absence of that small business bonus. 19.9% would have uh, prevented investment in their business, and 18.3% would have amended their plans for growth. So it would be good to see Mr Lockhart recognising the contribution this government is making to sustaining businesses that are existing. And Mr Lockhart might want also to reflect on the uh, chaos caused by his own government through Brexit, which we now know Mark Carney, the governor, he might want to listen to this. He might want to listen to this. Mark Carney, the governor of the Bank of England, has already said that £900 per household has been lost across the UK before we've even left the European Union. How about Mr Lockhart recognising that and the contribution to destroying our high streets?